Hey folks, it's time for another episode of the High Power Archery Podcast. It's been a busy few weeks and I hope everyone had a happy Thanksgiving. So first I want to just make a few announcements about what's been happening and what's to come in the new year. 2020, as you know, marked the beginning of the High Power Archery Podcast and it's been a wild ride for sure. We learned a lot about podcasting, which we knew absolutely nothing about when we started this thing and how to build a show and, you know, something that works and is both informative and won't put you to sleep at the same time, which I think a lot of people find in some other podcasts, not just archery podcasts anyway. Um, so it's been a learning experience. But, you know, over the last, I'd say, 10 episodes, we've put together a format that a lot of people like. Um, and we're going to be building on that starting with season two, which will debut in January. The show will still have the same format, but include expanded listener questions and, of course, uh, my Apprentice Land's tech segment, which we're going to call How Do You Do It? Uh, we think this will be great for both the experienced and new archers alike, and, and we do hope that it will allow them to learn something new about tuning or shooting on each episode. Um, while we expand our listener questions and make it possible to record your questions now on our site, and we'll play those, and what we're actually going to do is have the opportunity, if you want to, to uh, call us and we'll record your question and answer session with you, like how we go through helping you out. And a lot of times people think, well, you know, they can, it's one thing you've probably taken hours to figure out how to answer something so it doesn't sound stupid on, on the air or something like that. No, we can actually do it on the phone with you. We'll record it right to the podcast and play it on the podcast. Um, some shows do that. I think it's something we're going to try, and I think it'll work out well. Now we just need people to ask us questions and record their stuff or call us, call in for it, and we'll arrange that call in for you. It won't be a big deal. Um, we will also be in January, hopefully January. We've been working on it for a while, at least the scripting for it. Um, we'll be debuting our video series on YouTube. Uh I've been writing the content for the stuff for a while, and I think you'll find them both informative and fun at the same time. Too often tech videos are overly technical and just plain boring. Um, I think that my students will make it easier to understand because I'm going to record them as they do it. Um, and it's generally so simple that anyone can do it. Uh, so that's all to come in a new year. Now on today's episode, the subject of which is, so, is all about training. And I've gone over this in other episodes before, and I have to tell you, I recorded another podcast a few days ago, but yesterday, the local state governments here in New York and New Jersey, uh, they announced that we're probably be going back to uh, to a lockdown again with this whole COVID-19 thing. In New Jersey, they just limited indoor, spo- indoor sports, and it looks like we might be in for, an, for another stressful season. Things where things get canceled, where you can't shoot like you normally would, where all of a sudden those facilities that you're used to using that you took for granted for a long time ago and starting to realize, wow, I didn't realize what it would be like if we lost that, they may be going away again for a while. So often I'm asked, uh, how do you find good instruction? And you all know how I feel on that subject. And sometimes there aren't any programs around. And let's just say that there isn't a club or a program around. How do you start a club and keep people interested and eventually wind up getting some form of organized instruction going. So I've covered most of that before. I think it's important to go over it a bit more here on this episode. But again, this episode is going to jump around to a lot of different things. So if you think it's all about just, you know, instruction and all that, it's not. Bear with me for a second. Anyway, so problem number one is how to find a coach or a program. When you're talking about coaching for the most part, um, you want to deal with someone who's certified. But again, remember what I said, a piece of paper is just that, a piece of paper. However, when it comes to kids, especially for kids, you want someone who's taking the time to make sure that they are certified. What does certified mean? Does it mean that they're expert expert instructors? I've seen level four coaches who have no idea what they're doing. Honestly, don't have a clue. So paper means nothing, like I said. But what it does mean is that these people went through the background screening process to make sure that they're not dangerous to your kids. And the organization is saying, hey, from what we've seen, this person is safe to work with. That does not mean let your guard down. That does not mean that they're babysitters you leave your kids with. What that means is they've taken the time, they've passed a general background check when you get to USA Archery higher levels, like level three and four, then additional 
part of that training is to make sure we go through um, awareness training to know how we recognize abuse and abuse of kids, how not to allow kids to bully each other, that sort of thing. And that all adds up. But like I said, in the end, it's just a piece of paper. You have to use your eyes and your own judgment to determine if the person that you're taking him to is safe enough to work with your kids. And reputation is everything. If you hear that someone's got a bad reputation for working with kids, that they're impatient or just plain nasty, or that they like to yell a lot at them, more than likely, this is not someone that you want to deal with. Even as an adult, if the person that you're working with does not take the time to help you out, they're not really people you should be dealing with. So you can go to the USA Archery webpage, and you can actually look for a coach in your area. So you can sort out by state, you can sort out by level, whatever you're looking for, and you can find someone. Usually they have an email or contact on there, and you can reach out to them and find out if they're coaching, especially in this day and age where we don't know what coaching is going to look like. We don't know how far it's going to be before we get into another lockdown situation. Some people have the ability to do it. Some people don't. So you may have to reach out to more than one person, but don't give up and you'll find someone eventually. So that helps you get a coach. Also, sometimes you're at the local range and you see someone who helps other people. Don't be afraid to ask. If you're afraid to ask, you're never going to find out. You're at a shop. Sometimes we, the, the shop guys, they know what they're doing. They don't always know what they're doing. And again, just like I said, it's just a piece of paper. But if you happen to be at a shop and, the, and you, know, you, you pay for a lesson and you don't like something the way it was going or it feels odd, then don't do it again. Feel free to email me. I'll tell you something's wrong. I think you've heard enough horror stories on this show before where I mentioned what's happened with shop guys. It's not like every person in a shop is out to get you. But not for nothing. Sometimes these guys don't know any better when it comes to how to teach people. Or they're the old school guy who, like, this is the way I do it. If you don't want to do it, then you're an idiot and you don't know what you're doing. And I hate to hear stuff like that. It's not necessarily out of, out of malice that they do it. They just don't know any better. This is all they've ever done. And chances are the person who taught them did the exact same thing. One begets another. So again, select carefully where you want it to be. Now, that covers how to find a coach or someone to teach you. But let's just say there's nobody around and no one in your area. And I have people who contact me from all around the country, all around the world for that matter. And it's very humbling to see someone from the Netherlands email me about, they don't have a coach over there. Can I help them at all? How do I help them? Or somebody from South Africa where I've got a listener who calls me and says, hey, um, I want to see what I can do. My form is a little suspect. I don't know if it's me or if it's my equipment or something like that. So there are alternate routes in this day and age because we have everything so modernized. Maybe it's not modern where you are. really doesn't matter. But let's just say you have the opportunity to use the internet, okay? A lot of coaches these days offer remote coaching. Now, not everybody can afford it. I will tell you up front, I have people that I talk to who in their, in their life, the most important thing to them are friends and family putting a roof over their head. The money to spend on a coach just isn't there. Does that mean that I tell them, go take a hike? No, it doesn't. And even with these people who are remote to me, if you are a coach and if you're in it for the right reasons, you got to know when you yourself have to make a sacrifice. To me, it's not a sacrifice. It's just part of what I do. So I'll get on, if these people can find the means to get on a FaceTime over their iPhone or on an iPad or use Skype or Zoom or something like that, I'll help them out. Even when they're in very, very different time zones, I can't do it every day because I work a regular job like everybody else. But the fact is that if they ask for help, I'm going to try to help them. If you're a coach listening to this and 
that's not something that you would ever do because it violates your principles. Like if I'm not getting paid, I'm not doing it. Then as I've screamed in other episodes, maybe you should be doing something else. But if you help just one person get better, maybe, just maybe, they can help someone else at the same time. I've dealt with one guy who is actually in the Netherlands, didn't have access to any coaching out there, just him and his daughter. His daughter's 12. I got on a FaceTime with them at 3 o'clock in the morning, my time. For half an hour, I worked over his form. And I did that two times for him. Always telling him that if you don't understand something, email me or we'll do this again. That could have turned into 20 times for all I care. Didn't make a difference. But it only took two times. He took notes. He recorded himself. He got better. Because he took it as important to him not to waste my time or his by taking it seriously, using the advantage of what you got in that opportunity to do it. And with the stuff I taught him, he's teaching his daughter now. And they're both doing great. And that's why I do it. So sometimes if you don't have anybody around you, there are coaches, there are programs that can do it over FaceTime, that'll do it over Zoom, over Skype. So you're not shut out to that. Even if you have no club around you, you live out somewhere where there's no archery range local to you, but you're shooting your backyard or out in the countryside, whatever it is. That's no excuse for not doing it the right way. Now, part of the reason we're putting together a whole YouTube thing is because we want people to see how we teach, how to do different things, including how to correct someone's form and how you should start out on form the right way. There are sources of information out there already that can help you with this. So some will ask, well, if there's sources out there that help you with that, why would I bother doing another one? Because there are sources out there that do it, and one of the best is Knock On Nation. That's Knock On TV, John Dudley. He has a whole school of knock that he put together. And he shows you how to shoot, how to tune your stuff, and it's very, very well done, professionally done on those series. And we hope to produce the same type of thing. But why I'm doing our own is because I have my own way of teaching it. He has his own way of teaching it. What he does is going to work for some people. What I do is going to work for others. So as long as the source of the material is good, you have access to do it, to learn that way if you have to. The old, the old saying was, you can't learn how to do karate out of a video or out of a book. That's true. However, you can't learn it perfectly. But when you take a base of nothing or no training, that is something to start with. And again, people will see the videos and have questions about how something works. I know for a fact that at Knock On, they'll answer questions if you don't understand something. They have a huge subscriber base. I'm talking about tens of thousands of people. So maybe they take a little longer to get back to somebody. Right now at our stage of the game, we don't have a lot of people to do that. Maybe 800, 1,000 people who might email us or ask for stuff. And I'm talking about over the course of a few months. That's fine. All that means is that I'm going to answer quicker. Is my answer going to be any better than what John Dudley gives you or one of his staff gives you? Not necessarily but I might be able to take more time to do that. And the one thing that I will promise is that if we get bigger, that's not going to change. And that's a hard promise to keep. However, the way I've built my program and with my kids, stuff like that, I think that more than one of us can answer the question because I pride myself on the fact that my girls are copying copies of me when it comes to teaching. So, there's going to be more of us who can answer it. That's how I think we can keep it going like that. So to that point, like I said, online, there are plenty of things to learn from. Again, reputation is everything. 
the only one that I will recommend right now for that is Knock On. Because I've seen all the things he does. He doesn't do anything boneheaded. He doesn't do anything dangerous. And he's one of the few people I've seen where he actually cares about his content. And we're going to be the same way. There are lots of other videos out there that will show you how to do the dumbest of things that will get you hurt. How to draw a bow this way. Yet yeah, you'll rip your shoulder apart doing it. We're talking about stuff that is important to build a base. And if you don't do it the right way, it's going to cost you in pain, in aggravation, in getting fed up with something because you're not getting any better, so you just quit. And that's the last thing we need to see. So for something like this, like I said, online, plenty of resources. Good, reliable coaches out there who will do a session like this for you. Some will charge more than others. You do your research. If you don't, can't find anything like that, email me. I'll work it in there somewhere, or I'll be able to point you at someone, if you want, who can probably help you. I have contacts all over the country that I can send you to if you need in person. We can work something out for you. I will help you. I've never said no to trying to help someone. So that's what that's about. If there's no local coaching, no local programs, you're not shut out. You can still do it. Problem three is how do you know you're getting the right advice? Like when you go to a coach, I mean, if he says something obviously is wrong or it doesn't sound right, it doesn't feel right, how do you know he's right? Simple. Ask. Say, this is bothering me. If you don't get a really thorough response about why they're doing it and they just say something like, because that's the way I do it, go somewhere else. Or again, email me. We'll help you out with that. This all, boil, this all boils down to how you get the information to you, how you get this to work. Shops are another problem. I've talked about them in the past. They, Like I said, they're not the, the evil out there. Shops exist to be a source where you can get stuff. I'm in New York, okay? I run a private business, so my coaching and all that, I don't have a storefront because the stuff is crazy expensive out here to run a storefront. But there are a couple of shops. Not all have the greatest reputation in the world. But they have their purpose. If you need to get something in a pinch and you don't have that shop local to you, what are you going to do? Unfortunately, the sporting goods stores around here don't even carry the stuff anymore. Here we have Dick's Sporting Goods. They don't even carry half of the hunting equipment that you're looking for. And that's not a shot at them. It's just the world we live in. In Staten Island, where I live and work out of, they're not even allowed to have hunting and fishing stuff here. Don't ask me why that is. They just don't. Oh, they sell hunting license, but they don't have that. So sometimes having a resource, a shop, whatever near you, is something that's taken for granted. And these people pay a lot of money in their rent, and it's hard for them to stay open. So sometimes their price is going to be higher. But for the convenience of being able to have that, sometimes you want to pay a little bit more. It's worth paying a little bit more. But that's still no excuse for them to treat you wrong if that happens. Or if they don't have the expertise for what you need, at least they should tell you, we can't or we're too busy. And if that happens, there are other resources available online. You can have online coaching, a lot of different things like that. And that goes for tuning, that goes for instruction, that goes for everything. Lastly, what I'm going to talk about with, you know, on this particular subject, and again, it's a sensitive one because it means a lot to me because I'm a coach, is the mentor part of this. What do I mean by mentoring? Well, see, when I was growing up, I had the advantage of someone who took me under their wing and showed me everything that they knew about archery. And that was expensive, extensive, not expensive, extensive. It took a lot of years to learn a tenth of what this man had to teach me. Now, that's how to shoot a bow. But to me, how to shoot a bow is part of learning how to live life. And the people that you rely on to be this type of mentor to you are extremely important. That's why I take it so seriously as a coach. 
Now, you're not going to find these people every day. They're not going to be easy to find. But like I said before, if you don't look, you're not going to find them. We all see the TV personalities down there. Okay? Um, watch all, this, all the outdoor shows and all that. And you'll see these guys like, well, that guy kills the biggest deer I've ever seen. He must be the greatest dude in the world. Some of these people are legitimate, nice people. I could name four or five who are legitimate, nice people. Unfortunately, I can also name 80% of them who, A, in real life, if they didn't have the hunt set up for them, or were not hunting some private property where everything's been... As much as you can do without staging it, it's been staged. They've had those things scouted out, not by themselves. They just come in there to to do what they're going to do. They've had it scouted. They've had it planned. They've got a crew of 100 people working on it. Yeah, they can make a great show. You ever talk to these people for five minutes at a show or something like that? And they're horrible people. I'm not saying it's all of them. I'm not even mentioning names. But I will tell you, That as a mentor, they would suck. Mentoring is not about somebody who's the big killer on the block when it comes to deer hunting and kills the biggest deer in the world. Because that is a celebrity. Someone who makes their living on the impression that they're the ultimate go-be-it of hunting. The same way in the target world, someone who you see out there shooting And winning all over the place, right? Yeah, they know what they're doing. Some of them can't coach for their life. And I'll tell you something. Just because someone's a champion does not mean that their coaching you is going to make you a champion. In fact, some of those people that you see are champions out there are not the nicest people in the world either. However, I will tell you there are rare exceptions to that. They do exist. If you ever meet Paige Pierce... Okay, who's one of the best female shooters in the world. She is not the arrogant person that she could be if she wanted to, because after all, she's won everything. It's probably not a 3D. She can't win. Indoor, on the feeder circuit, she's won a lot, won as much as anyone else has ever won. But you talk to her for five minutes, and you'll see She's not one of these Barbie dolls. She's a real person who is willing to talk to you. I've seen her working with kids at Vegas, putting a smile on their face, and that's everything to her. You got to be like that if you're going to be somebody's mentor. People look up to her. Unfortunately, half the people out there aren't like that, and that's a shame. To me, that's a crime. But again, Your mentor could be somebody who is a good shooter, willing to take the time to work with you. I had the good fortune of having one of the best mentors ever in the sport to teach me what I learned. And if you ever meet me in person, I'll be glad to tell you about it. But what I'm going to say is this. Unless you find the right person, and you'll know them right away because they'll take time with you. It's going to be difficult. And for a parent, if you can't find that person, keep looking. The worst thing you can possibly do is to stick your kid with someone who doesn't care about them, cares only about getting paid, and doesn't really think about anything else. And there are a lot more of them than you think out there. But I will tell you this, and I'm not tooting my own horn because this is something I've seen in other good coaches. And by the standard of a good coach, I'm not calling myself a good coach. I'm just telling you, I can say for myself, other people have told me that. But I don't really care about that. What I really care about is they say, I'm a coach who cares. That's more important to me. So if you can find someone who cares, who makes that child of yours or you the center of their attention, doing everything possible. If they can't figure something out with you, they find a way where you'll understand it. That's what you want. That goes for target shooting. That goes for hunting as well. 
Both of them are very important. A hunting mentor, like I mentioned on the last podcast, that's someone that is willing to go out, go out there with you and show you how to do it the right way. Unfortunately, not a lot of people are willing to do that these days anymore. But like I said, if you're in my area and you're new to this, or even if you've been doing this for a long time, and you need someone to show you how to do it the right way, call me, email me. If you email me, I always answer. And no matter how odd the request, if I can find a way to help you, I'm going to do that. So it's important to find someone who cares as much about helping you as you care about getting the help in the first place. So to review, find a good coach, find a program. USA Archery is a valuable tool for doing that. Two, after you've done that, you check the credentials and everything. Best thing to do is in your area, find a club. If you don't find a club, look at online coaching. Look at videos to show you how to do stuff. Start your own club. A bunch of you who are getting together, learning how to shoot together can improve each other. One person will pick up on something where the other person won't, and you can help each other. It's, archery is about always learning something different, always being open to learning something different. Because if you don't, it's not going to work for you. How to know you're getting the right stuff? Ask around. Ask me, email me. I'll tell you if what you're hearing is right or wrong. But generally on someone's reputation, you can find that out. Sources available, like I said, knock on, knock on our tree. It's got some of the best school of knock videos. We're going to be coming out with our own videos in January. The shops are also, you know, if you got a good shop near you, go to them, make use of them, feel them out for yourself. Don't go into working with anyone that includes a shop, a coach or anything assuming they're going to help you go in there with an open mind. But if you don't hear the right thing, don't be afraid to walk away. Some people are scared that if they go into a place and someone tries to sell them something, they have to buy it no matter what, because it's embarrassing to walk away. Let me tell you something. I'm the worst person in the world who has to go and buy a new car because I nitpick the nitpick these guys to death. But in the end, if I don't like what I'm hearing, I walk away. Archery and coaching are no different. If you don't like what you're hearing or you feel uncomfortable in the slightest way, and particularly when you're dealing with your kids, walk away. So that's it for this part of the episode. So now we're going to go on to our listener question segment. Now we're going to start with Brian L. who writes, As a long-distance shooter, what do you think of the top end of arrow models? I'm shooting Victory Rip Elites V1, which go for $130 a dozen. They offer V3 and V6, which are each a step down in straightness, and V6 goes for $80 a dozen. I don't mind spending the extra if it makes a real difference. I'm a 70-yard shooter. But every sport has its marketing hype, especially at the top range. I would love to hear your opinion. Look forward to your next episode, Brian. Well, Brian, thank you for listening to us in the first place. Now, I did write you a very lengthy response to this. Hope it doesn't put you to sleep reading it. But I tried to be as... And again, I got to be careful how I say this as open as possible on the subject when it comes to marketing hype and does it make a difference? So my honest opinion to this, some people will want to shoot me, but again, this is why I don't take sponsors. You get out of a dozen arrows as much as you're going to put into it. The value and the cost of those arrows really doesn't make a difference. I'll tell you why. First of all, just because someone's marketing an expensive set of arrows is not going to make you a better shooter. I don't care who you are. They make a difference on the elite level. For example, if you're shooting outdoor 50 meters, you'll see on YouTube and if you go to a competition, the top shooters are always shooting something like X-10s or the new Black Eagle Revelations. These are shafts that can go from 400 to 500, a dozen, plus your components. It's a lot of money. Now, does that mean that I take Joe Blow off the street, whose form sucks, and I can give him a set of X-10s or Revelations, and I'm going to turn him into the next you know, World Cup medalist? 
No, it doesn't. What it means is those arrows are engineered as part of a system to maybe, if everything else is perfect, get you an extra point or two. To the average person shooting for recreation or regular competition, it's not going to do anything for you. But to that elite level, and I stress elite level, people who are doing this for a living, it might make an extra two or three points. That extra two or three points is the difference between being on the podium or not making a cut at all. Now, so what's all the hype about 003 straightness or this is like this shaft is this, this shaft is that? Marketing. Marketing. If you look at the gold tip videos, Tim Gillingham explains how to find run out on a shaft. Why find run out on a shaft? Because when they say straightness, for the most part, they're talking about the center 28 inches of the shaft. I don't know if you all check lately, the shafts are not 28 inches. Some are 31, 32. So if only the center 28 are, are spanned like that and measured for that, what does it say for either end? Now, I take a 005 straightness, a 003 straightness, and if I do all the right things, which I've been through on another podcast, but I'll mention them briefly here, which is spinning out to see which end is wobbling, and I cut from both ends until I get the absolute straightest I get, it's probably going to be straighter than a 001 or equal. Then I match my components, I weigh them out exactly the same, so that the end, the components and everything make the arrows weigh the same. And when it comes to like target arrows, there's a lot more stuff that we do, and especially on hunting arrows, because people say, well, you do that for target, you don't do that for hunting. I got news for you. The distance that I shoot at hunting, I make sure that those arrows have higher tolerances than, than that for target. Because now I'm shooting at a live animal that I do not want to wound. So yes, there are a lot of things. I mean, we spin them on the spine test or we check the ends to see if they're spinning true or not. We check the knocks. We scare, square both ends. You take a, a set of X10s that you're shooting 50 meters with that you spent six, $700 on, and I'll take a pair of X impacts or some other thin shaft that I've worked with a lot of time and effort in there to match them up, and to the regular shooter, they're going to shoot the same or better. Yeah, I just said that. To the regular shooter, there will be no difference or the ones that I worked on because whoever's building them for you took the time to do it right will shoot better. It's a fact. So is the hype worth it? Not really. Is the extra money worth it? Not really. To the average person, you can't tell the difference between a 003 and a 001. If you don't know the difference between a 003 and a 001, then what's the point? Do the one that you can afford. And I keep on telling this, do what you can afford. If you want to get more information on how that works, feel free to email me. Also, not like I said, most companies measure the center 28. Black Eagle measures the entire length of the shaft. I'm not saying that to toot Black Eagle's horn. I sell Black Eagle because I think they're probably some of the best shafts made. However, that doesn't knock Easton or anybody else out there. But for them, for the type of people that I work with, they're the best bang for your buck because if they're measuring the whole shaft, then they're going to have less opportunity for run out. That does not mean by any way, shape, or form that what they're selling doesn't have to be checked. I've had a few where the spine didn't match or there was run out on them. Yeah, the majority are going to be done the right way. It does not mean that that excuses you from doing your job and checking them. Again, Black Eagle is my preference. Why? I have to do less tuning with them. I can trust the stuff they do. But as they get bigger, if they don't keep it like that, they'll be in the same boat with everybody else, and I'll just give them the same treatment as everybody else. But for right now, I found them to be some of the best shooting shafts that are made. That when they say something on the label, they mean it. Doesn't mean that I don't check them. I got to check them. So there you go, James. Uh, there you go, Brian. Sorry, James is the next question up. I explained all that in the email. If you have a question about it, again, one of my videos will be on arrow building. But uh, hopefully that will help. Now, our next question comes from James P., who writes, Love the podcast. You always throw something interesting in there and 
the Don't Being That Guy segment, which is coming up, is just awesome. This past week, I was at the range with my son looking at a new bow. We were on a budget, and I wanted to see some of the entry-level bows they had. I asked about a brand they didn't carry. Oh, boy. And the guy at the shop said, if I don't see it there, it's because it's trash, and I shouldn't waste my time with it. I know you said to be aware of some of this stuff with shop guys, but is there anything I should look out for or avoid? I kind of got turned off by the conversation. I've been going to that same range and shop. I won't mention. Oh. (laughs) He's here in New York, and I know exactly where he went since he put it here in his email. I'm not going to say it on the air, but yeah, I know exactly what they do. I've been going to the same range and shop for over 10 years, but never bought a bow there. They always seem knowledgeable, but it's like they they flip their personalities when I ask the question about brand. Your insight would be really appreciated for this. Thanks, James. Well, James, I've said this time and time again. I'll say it again. Shops are there there to sell stuff. Unlike Miracle on 34th Street, that if you haven't seen it, it really dates me how old a kid I was. Um, In that, you know, in that particular movie, the Santa Claus they had, which turned out to be the real Santa Claus for the movie aspect of it, um, he angered people in the store because he was telling them, hey, you know, you're here in Macy's or Bloomingdale's or Grimble's or wherever it was. And he's telling people, well, they don't sell this toy here. Like when he's talking to the parents, what the kid wanted. He was saying, they don't sell this here, but you can go to this store. They have it over there, which is like heresy, like the worst thing in the world. Well, like I said, shops are often victims victims of their own circumstances when it comes to the salespeople. And sometimes they just, you know, yo-yos who only want to push a brand that they sell. Few shops, I know a few of them who are very honest with you, like, this is what we sell. These are the ones we sell. We don't have it here, then you're welcome to go try something else. We'll try to help set you up. Of course, there'll be a charge to help set you up. I do that all the time. I only sell PSE because I'm a PSE dealer. I don't sell Hoyt. I don't sell Elite or any other brands out there. I happen to sell PSE. Why? Because their brands have the most varied availability in different levels. And it's the one that approved me as a dealer. And it's the one I took. That may change in the future. I don't know. But for right now, that's what works for me. If you're in a shop, Sometimes they can't get other brands. Why? Because there's someone in the area already selling them. So they have zones for dealers. Other times the brands want too much money to get in the door. There's a lot that goes into getting a new brand into your door. I've dealt with that before. They deal with it. So a guy who tells you, I just don't carry that here, he's telling you the right thing. But a guy that says, if you don't see it here, it's because it's garbage. It's pretty simple to read through what he's saying. Don't get taken, you know, taken advantage by, by that. If he says it's garbage, he's just pushing his own stuff. And I hate it when people do that. And hate is a bad word that I try not to use. I really dislike it because you shouldn't hate anything or anyone. I learned that from somebody not too long ago, and it's changed a lot about me. But I'm going to tell you right now, when someone gives you a response like that, they're trying to push something. I don't care, and a lot of shops don't like me for this, if you buy your bow on Amazon, buy your bow in a shop, buy your bow anywhere because That's what you want to do, or that's what you can afford. You don't badmouth something simply because you don't carry that product. Now, if someone asks me about a particular brand or model that I have experience with, I may tell them, yep, I played with those before, and here's this and this wrong. Or here's the problem you might encounter. Or this model had this problem because they had exploding limbs or something like that but I have experience with it. I'm still not going to say it's a horrible bow because what if this person didn't tell me that they bought that bow already? Do I really want them to go home thinking, oh my God, what did I do? No. If they bought that bow already, 
but they see what I'm telling them is the problem, they're more than likely to say, how do I get around it? Doesn't mean they're screwed. That means I'll show you what to do. But to start off from a point where there's less problems, not the bow I would start with. But if you already got it, let's work from there. In no way should anyone badmouth something that they either have no experience with, and you'll find a lot of people, these insta-famous people, one of which I can tell you has no idea what she's doing. I won't mention her name, but if you listen to the Off-Center Archers podcast, we're great people that have been on. Yeah, they'll mention her. Um, Anyway, she's never used the products that she pushes. I can tell you that because she doesn't even know how to do anything with them. Bow presses, stands. I can tell she's never used it. So don't go recommending something you know nothing about. That's annoying. But that's what these people do. So when you see something like that, avoid it. Same way, just because they're a celebrity doesn't mean that what they're saying is right. In the end, you're the judge. If someone says something that doesn't sound right, do your research. Check it out. Before you buy something, do your research. Check it out. But just because someone's telling you to shop, I don't carry that, so it's garbage, it's nonsense. Believe it or not, I found something on Home Depot's website a couple of months ago from another customer that I have. He's like, well, I bought my bow at Home Depot. And it was a Chinese brand that Home Depot was selling on their site. I don't know if they're still selling it, but they were selling all kinds of archery equipment. Don't know how that got on there. But whatever. He had already bought that. Am I going to tell him that's garbage? No. I'm going to treat it like any other bow. What I do tell him is, remember, when you see off brands or something like that, they might not be manufactured to the highest tolerances. That does not mean it's garbage. What it means is we're going to double check stuff that normally we would assume is correct. But again, assuming anything, even on a name brand bow, is a mistake. We'll check stuff. Same way. Maybe the strings aren't made as well. So what? Get other strings for it. If it's something that is outright dangerous and I notice it, I'm going to say it. But that doesn't mean that I badmouth his purchase because he spent $150 on something that instead of spending $400 or $600 or $2,000 because he wanted to buy something other manufacturer's brand. If it's out there and you know about it, fine. You can say something about it, but don't go, you know, badmouthing a brand just because you don't carry it. So to James, as I explained to you in my reply to you, go somewhere else. Feel free if you have a question on which bow to get. If you want to get some on Amazon, the internet, again, you support your local shops. But if you don't have a choice, contact me. I will gladly take the time and tell you the goods and bads of everything. And if I know someone in the area, to tell you where they can go to help you out or where you can go to see them. And the last question comes from Facebook. We got this question from Mitchell C. Hey, Angel, on your next podcast or on a future one, can you go over some tree stand shots and how to shoot from one? My uncle had me do some shots before I went on my first tree stand hunt, bending at the waist. But I don't get how my 30-yard pin can make a 7-yard shot. All right. So a couple episodes back, I went over how to shoot shooting angles and stuff like that. And I'm going to do a tree stand video on how to do this right. When you first learn how to shoot, they tell you to bend at the waist. That's all well and good. Until the angle at which you are bending doesn't make any sense because if you're bending and say 45 degrees... Guess what? Your back foot's going to come off the ground. No, that's not how you do it. Without getting into too much detail, and I, like I said, I'm doing another whole other video about this. Without getting into too much detail, I can tell you this. The shoulders have to be in a straight line no matter what. If that means that you have to, in order to get your front arm down, you have to raise your anchor point on the back part of your face, you do that. But there has to be a straight line between your two hands. If you try bending at the waist, you're going to find out there's only so far you can bend before stuff starts to come apart. So if you do that, and Mitchell, you can email me and I'll go over and send you some graphics on how it works. If you do that, whether you're shooting indoor, where you're shooting a top and a bottom target, it makes a difference. But the bending at the waist thing, good to tell beginners because they don't comprehend what we're talking about yet, so you're showing them form basics. But when you get into the intermediate stuff and all that, And tree stand, believe it or not, is not a first-timer. Tree stand is intermediate, at least. Don't go learning how to shoot a bow today and getting into a tree stand tomorrow because you'll miss everything you hit. 
or if you do hit something, you're going to wound it. Tree stand stuff, there's ways to shoot that way, but it's applied to how you shoot uphill, downhill. It's not bending at the waist. You'll fall out of a tree stand by bending at the waist like that because eventually you're going to lose your balance and fall right out. So again, we'll get into that in another uh, another episode or another video we're working on. But yeah, Mitchell, just email me again if you don't get it, and I'll be happy to go over it with you. So now, comes to that segment that everyone seems to enjoy the most. And I do lose my tent- temper every now and then. I'm trying not to. Today, you know, with the recent announcement about the COVID thing and all that made me think. So it's time for don't be that guy. And I'm going to tell you that too often people see someone on the range and keep their distance because they're different or simply because they don't know them. Or now because like, hey, it's COVID-19. I don't want this guy 80 yards away from me. He's got to stay away. Um, and, t- and it's true. In today's age of COVID, we have to keep our distance, six feet, whatever, wearing a mask. It is what it is. It's the world we live in. But there is absolutely no excuse for being antisocial or unfriendly just because you don't know someone. So today's don't be that guy goes out to those people who go on the range or anywhere for that matter and just ignore everyone around them. Sometimes they think that they're below them or they're not their kind of people. Bottom line is, don't be that guy so arrogant that you forget what being human is all about. In today's world, we're being forced to be separated for safety reasons. I get it completely. But people are using that excuse for pushing their elitist agenda, which leads to people feeling isolated and getting those clicky groups going that just breed more intolerance. Don't be that guy who's the cause of the problem. You never know that someone is about what someone's all about until you talk to them. Maybe they really are someone you don't want anything to do with. But they might turn out to be someone that you can make a good friend out of. You never know. Don't be that guy who judges by what someone looks like out there. And yeah, I'm crossing into a territory that maybe I shouldn't because there are a lot of people who, based on what someone looks like, won't talk to someone or think, I'm staying away from that person. Okay? To me, Again, I will say this a million times. I truly mean it. But first, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that it wasn't so long ago where I was that guy. And it, it hurts to say I was that guy who went to the range, worked with my students, and other people like you see him and like this guy is like some kind of jock over there, you know, the typical, oh, I'm Mr. Macho Man, whatever. I wouldn't give these guys the time of day. Why? Because my experience with people like that had led me to believe that they were like that. But I got to tell you something. Somebody changed me for the better and taught me that everyone is different. I don't care what they look like. Race, color, creed, that's that's never mattered to me. With me, it was hang up on this type of stereotype of person. But everyone is different. Give them the opportunity. Talk to them. I've made some of the best friends I have because people that normally before this I wouldn't have talked to, I walked over and said, hey, you need help with that? You know, or what's going on? Something like that. I see them having a problem. Before, I wouldn't have talked to them. So for a while, I was that guy that I'm telling you not to be. But not anymore. So if you are that guy, do yourself a favor. Don't be. True meaning of don't be that guy. Like I said, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't be that guy who goes out into the rain saying, I'm here, I'm me, I don't care about any of these people. Those people are freaks over there. I have people who go to the range that I go to who don't speak the same language as me. I've mentioned them before, a bunch of guys, I think they're from from Nepal or something like that, where they go and they shoot in their own little group and all that, and a lot of people can't stand them because there's so many of them. Who cares? Be human. Be friendly. Don't be that guy who is a historical jackass because someone looks different from you or because someone has different preferences than you. I don't care. Again, I mention it however many times, Archery is for everyone. 
No, I'm not going to scream at the top of my lungs because maybe some people get turned off by that. But I am going to say this. Nobody should be singled out because of the way they look, because of their gender, because of whatever preference they have, the way they dress, what they can afford to shoot or anything like that. But I see too many people come in the range and look at people like that, and they are that guy who treats people like that. Unfortunately, for everyone who does it like me, there's probably 100 people who do it like that guy. Not called for. Unnecessary. Give yourself a chance. Talk to these people. Maybe you'll like them. Maybe you won't. But don't assume something based on how somebody looks or because of what they're shooting. Don't be that guy. Don't be the fool that I used to be for a long time. Learn that everyone has the potential to be something different. Because if I still had my head stuck up my ass like I did back then, I wouldn't be where I am right now with a lot of students because everyone would have thought that he's that guy who's an ass. And the one thing I pride all my kids with is learn how to recognize an ass hat, but find out if they actually are first. Don't assume someone is an ass hat. Let them open their mouth and when they prove themselves to be an ass hat, that's fine. So like I said, don't be that guy who judges somebody by the way they look, what they're shooting. Yeah, not the most fiery don't be that guy segment I've ever had. Doesn't have to be. But it's just as important. Hope it wasn't a letdown for anyone. I didn't start screaming at the top of my head. I promise you the next one, which I had recorded the other day, um, that one will have some fire in it. Because that one's priceless. But for this one, where we're going into a time that we're going to be limiting what we can do again because we know it's coming. While they're trying to make us further apart, how about for a change, we try to do something that may actually bring us all closer together as an archery community. Let's give that a try for a change. So, um, in review, we went over everything on how to find a program, how to start something, how to get coaching. We went over our listener questions, what not to be when it comes to be that guy. Um, Recently, we were on an episode of the Off Center Archers, who are really great people. It's not PG rated. There is some adult language. So it's a great listen for the kids. Stick listening to here, and I'll have them on, and we'll try to keep it PG, which is going to be hard. But we're going to give it a shot anyway. But they're really great people to listen to. They're entertaining they have a great podcast um we're trying to expand you know our presence more and more all the time like every time i say it if you have a question you can find it on our website you can send us a question on our website you can find us on facebook you can find us on instagram which i haven't been that active lately um we'll be getting more active as the weather clears up and also with some other stuff that i've been working on so that's more to come don't think i disappeared off the planet people um, there's a lot more going on and like I said season 2 which starts in January will have new segments you'll have Leanne my apprentice and a lot of other people involved but we hope to make it a better experience for you so the next episode will be will be the last one for 2020 that'll come out mid-December and then we start 2021 January 2021 will launch season 2 of the High Power Archery Podcast and we're really looking forward to it we have a lot of good stuff installed install for you know in, install <laughs> coming for you folks so until then like we always say it's never goodbye it's until we see you again so till we do see you again stay safe and shoot straight